from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Growing up near our nation's capital in the shadow of solemn remembrances at Arlington National Cemetery and the annual Memorial Day concert on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol, I learned very early in life that Memorial Day was far more than just a three-day weekend that kicks off the summer season. And in a very personal way, I tenderly remember the annual ritual, a sacred observance by my great Aunt Fran, who even today at the age of, let's see, Aunt Fran is now 94. Every Memorial Day, she still goes out to the cemeteries and decorates the graves of family and friends with flowers and ribbons of red, white, and blue. This national holiday is indeed about more than shopping at Memorial Day sales and the Indy 500 going to the beach and backyard barbecues. And for some, for many, including those whom we probably too often forget who have lost loved ones very recently in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, Memorial Day is a day to grieve. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time to grieve, a time to weep, and there are many reasons to weep with grief. Of course, the death of loved ones is what we often think of, but we have to also include our four-footed loved ones grieving over failing health and declining memories, grieving over the end of any relationship, grieving over the transitions in life, whether it's moving from a home where there are so many cherished memories or saying goodbye to a job that you loved or graduates who at this time of year are experiencing the mixed emotions of excitement for future opportunities and the sadness of leaving behind memories and relationships. There is a time to weep, a time to grieve, but you know we have to acknowledge as we recognize the Bible does say there is a time to weep, a time to grieve, that there's a certain awkwardness that we feel about grieving. There's a certain discomfort that our culture has about weeping. Our culture of self-sufficiency and stiff upper lips does not readily embrace grief. I think men in particular find it awkward to grieve because we're so socially conditioned to be strong and tough. But it's not just men. How many of you women have heard, big girls don't cry? And on top of our cultural discomfort with grief, there's an added layer of discomfort for those of us in the church, I think. Because as Christians, there is often a fear that grief might signal a lack of faith. Because after all, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead and we've just talked about for several weeks that heaven is for real. So then if we believe this, if we really believe it, then why on earth would you be wrapped up in grief 
If indeed one day Jesus is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, then why should there be tears in our eyes now for those of us who believe? And so how do we understand the place of grief in light of resurrection and the hope of heaven? Heaven is for real. Amen? Heaven is for real. But we're not there yet. And the world continues to groan for its full restoration when Jesus comes. And the pain of grief is part of being human on this side of eternity. And looking to Jesus, we see in one of the most profound moments of his life here on earth, recorded in the 11th chapter of John, Jesus goes to be with Mary and Martha as their brother and Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. And in that shortest of all the verses in Scripture, John eleven thirty five, it says very succinctly but very profoundly, Jesus wept. And I've always wondered why. Why would Jesus weep? Jesus, who is the Son of God, Jesus who knew what his mission was, on earth, Jesus who knew that all things were possible with God, Jesus who knew that, that, that Lazarus would one day rise from the dead. In fact, he's already said this to Martha. So why would Jesus weep? Well, we have to remember, first of all, that Jesus was fully God and fully human, and part of being fully human means humans grieve. We were wired to grieve when we're sad. And even though Jesus, yes, knew that Lazarus would rise from the dead, those who are observing Jesus weeping, they make a comment in the next verse, when they saw Jesus weeping, they said, see how he loved him. And so if Jesus grieved, so can we. This text from 1 Thessalonians, Paul is, is teaching about our resurrection hope. He is instructing the church at Thessalonica and instructing all of us through these words that, that yes, one day Jesus will return and, and our souls will be reunited with our bodies and we will be joined with all those who have gone to be with Christ in a joyous reunion. And Paul says, we do not want you to be misinformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And this verse has often been misinterpreted or misread based on where you put the emphasis in the sentence. Because it's often been read, do not grieve as those who have no hope. In other words, it's often been misread as, as Christians, you have hope, so do not grieve. But actually, the best translation of the original Greek in which Paul wrote says, do not grieve in the same way that others grieve who have no hope. Do not grieve in the same way that others who have no hope grieve. There's the acknowledgement that everyone grieves. But as John Stott points out, what Paul prohibits is not grief, but hopeless grief. Hopeless grief is grief that does not reflect any of the hope we have through the resurrection of Jesus. As Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, if only for this life we had hoped in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. We believe that because Jesus died and rose again, this life is not all that there is. And I, and I can't tell you how often walking with others through the path of, of Grief, people have commented 
people of faith, even through their pain. I don't know how people get through this without Jesus. Because indeed, if we don't have the hope in Jesus, grief can be a bottomless pit. The Bible encourages us to grieve and to recognize the difference between hopeless grief and good grief. Hopeless grief is allowing sadness to rule our hearts, allowing that loss to overwhelm us, to, to, to overshadow us every single day and night and continuously so that that becomes something we are almost obsessed or preoccupied with. It blocks joy, any of the joy in our life. Hopeless grief is what gives in to destructive behavior such as drinking or excessively over-medicating as a way of escaping that pain. Hopeless grief is allowing a loss or a failure to define us. In Christ, we are never ultimately defined as a widow or as a divorced person or as unemployed. Yes, those may be markers of our life here on earth, but that is not our ultimate definition and we shall not be paralyzed through the hope of Christ when we are even grieving. We shall not be paralyzed because of the hope of Christ. We cannot be defined by those losses and failures. Hopeless grief is clinging to a situation or to a loved one in ways that don't recognize or even celebrate our resurrection hope that affirm that God is always at work to make things new and to bless us with hope and healing. Life is not over. That's hopeless grief says life is over when we've had a loss. Grief with hope says yes, it is awful. But as the song says, because he lives, I can face the future. Hopeless grief might look like keeping a room of a deceased loved one untouched for years. Acknowledging that maybe that person has not died or is always going to be with us in that, in that frozen in time way. Now, we all grieve in different ways, but ask ourselves, when are we grieving in hopelessness? And when are we grieving in the light of Christ? Good grief is all about tears and sadness. Good grief remembers our loved ones in ways that acknowledge we miss them, and at the same time affirms our hope in heaven through the resurrection of Jesus. And if we've lost someone in our life, we don't ever forget about those who have died. And we honor them, just like my dear aunt goes out to the graves and remembers the loved ones who have died in a special way, signifying that their life here on earth meant something. We don't forget, but... One of the things that was very helpful for me early on in my ministry when I did some training with hospice was the teacher talked about one of the goals of grief is not to move past or move beyond a loved one, but it is to, and I love this phrase, to emotionally relocate the person we have lost. And you can apply this to other situations too, but particularly I think for the loss of a loved one. To get to the point where we can, with hope in Christ, emotionally relocate them. They are not gone. 
but they have been relocated. They're with God, those who are in Christ. And we can continue to live knowing that they are safe in the arms of Jesus. And we can move on emotionally, always treasuring and cherishing that relationship, never forgetting, knowing that God is good. Hopeless grief is what keeps us stuck in misery. Good grief does, in time, bring healing. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, how many of us have heard that verse, particularly if we've gone through seasons of grief and said, what? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I don't think Jesus is just talking about our final hope of heaven. I think Jesus is also talking about the realities of the here and now, particularly as you look at the rest of the context of the Sermon on the Mount. When he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, I think Jesus is saying that when we allow ourselves to mourn through the mourning, through that working through the grief, then part of that is what brings us comfort. When we shove it under the rug, when we pretend it isn't there, when we deny because in our sense of we have to put on a good front as Christians or as strong, tough people, we do not open ourselves to the healing that God wants to bring. Jesus says, blessed are you who mourn. You who mourn will be comforted. Before um, the, this year's Kentucky Wildcats team went all the way to the championship game with five freshmen starting, there was another great team of five freshmen known as the Fab Five, the University of Michigan, 1993. Anyone remember that team? They were a dynamite team. They went all the way to the championship game. And then in one of the most bizarre mistakes ever, towards the end of the game, Michigan messed up and they lost the championship. And on the way to the locker room, as reporters do, they shoved a microphone in the face of Michigan's coach, Steve Fisher, and they said, Coach, what are you going to tell your team? And Coach Fisher said, Cry. Feel awful. It's a rather uncoach-like thing to say. <laughs> Shouldn't a coach be saying to players, don't worry, we'll win next year. Or you can be proud of yourselves. You played a good game. Or, you know, we did this well. We did well just by getting this far. Kenneth Hawk, who is the um, founder of Stephen Ministry, referred to this situation. And he pointed out there's brilliance in what Steve Fisher said. A coach helping his players to feel things first to acknowledge that they felt terrible to have come this far and to have lost. He says, what a way to clear out their emotions so that team members could begin getting on with their lives. Well, as I was reflecting this week about grief and what good grief might look like in Christ, my thoughts went back to standing around the hospital bed of John Sabo. I was a young associate pastor, and John was a big guy with a huge heart. He often would sing solos at our church. He hosted a local radio program that played southern gospel music, and he had a sense of humor that I remember kept me in stitches when we traveled together with a bunch of other guys up to Washington, D.C. in 1997 for the Stand in the Gap Million Man March on Washington for Christ, sponsored by the Promise Keepers. And it was a few years after that that I stood with John's family and friends around his hospital bed as he was dying of liver cancer. And we had about as many people as you could possibly squeeze into one hospital room there gathered around John. And 
There were a lot of tears and some heavy sobs of sadness. Remember John's wife. Remember his mother who was there. Just shaking her head. She couldn't believe her son was going before she was. In the midst of the tears, there was also laughter. As John kidded with all of us and with the wonderful nurses who cared for him. And the kidding was in no way denying the awfulness of the situation. It was not by any means a way of avoiding the reality that a man we loved was dying. It was just part of, of who we always were with John, kidding and joking and laughing. And it was, in a sense, our gift to him and his gift to us to continue being the way we had always been. And there was a certain sense of, hope even in the midst of the sadness. I remember someone commenting, it feels like the Holy Spirit is here. It was a picture of an authentic Christian community grieving and weeping with one another. And I offered a prayer and as all of us held hands, John from his bed began to sing a song that we had often sung in church. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. And as John began singing that, I lost it. I was supposed to be the pastor there being strong for everybody else and I was losing it. The tears burned. Tears of anger that John was dying much too young, tears of sadness for John's wife and his mother and for me, losing a relationship that I had enjoyed. And there were tears, those tears were also tears of hope. Because it hit me so powerfully, here was a man who believed, whose faith would soon be sight. And all of these emotions, anger and sadness and hope, were contained in those tears. And I remember at John's funeral, there was a lot of crying, especially as his wife and his mother and others openly wept as we followed John's casket out the church, singing, God will make a way. It was a very sad day, but it was definitely good grief. Grief that was tenderly held in the hands of Jesus, who himself wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Grief that was not hopeless, but that affirmed through our tears that God would make a way because we knew at the very depths of our being that God always does make a way. That God has made a way through Jesus Christ and his resurrection on Easter so that all who believe will not be gone forever, but will be reunited with him and with others in heaven. And so, as Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died. So that you may not grieve in the same way that others who have no hope grieve. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. Alleluia.